So, Paul, we, we kind of figure out there's some ingredients to these atoms. Protons. Oh, the weird ones. <laughs> that's right. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. But I, I'm a terrible baker, and I know I just can't randomly throw stuff and make it to work. You need precisely the right amounts in order to get something that turns out. Okay, so we've got our three ingredients. What mixes are possible? Yep. Now, the first thing to say is that the number of electrons and protons by and large has to match. And that's because of that charge. Yes. So electrons, remember, have a negative charge and the protons have a positive charge. But most atoms are not charged. Yep. Um, you have to rub something to get a charge. The, the repulsion between charged particles or attraction is incredibly strong. So, for example, if you had 1% too many electrons yep. and I had 1% too many electrons, we would repel each other. Ah. But the repulsion force would be enough to rip the Earth in half. That's a lot. It is. The, the electrostatic force, as it's called, the force of repulsion or attraction, is much stronger than gravity. The only reason we don't notice it is because everything is so beautifully balanced. The number of positive and negative charges is the same to 10, 15 decimal places. If it wasn't, we would forget about gravity. Everything would be blown apart. By this electromagnetic force. This is my pet theory for how the, the Death Star destroys planets. <laughs> it fires a beam of extra electrons and the repulsion blows the planet apart. The trouble is the extra electrons in the Death Star would cause it to blow apart and the beam would diverge as they all repel each other. Well, maybe that's the force, but that's a different discussion. <laughs> yes, anyway. So, by and large, number of electrons must match the number yep. of protons. You do get atoms where you've stripped some off this called an ion. Yeah, so those do exist, but they don't exist as much as the... The neutral atoms. And even if they do, the electrons are still usually wandering around somewhere in the vicinity. So an overall cloud of ionized gas, which is called a plasma, yep. um, which we're going to talk about much more, um, are also still neutral because while the electrons have been stripped from the atoms, they're still in the vicinity. So that's easy. Number of electrons equals number of protons. Yep. So that means when you've got something like hydrogen with one electron, it must have one proton. Helium with two electrons must have two protons. Iron, 26 protons, 26 electrons, and so on. That's right. But how about the protons and neutrons? Well, this is a bit more complicated, but we can plot a diagram. We plot the number of neutrons here against the number of protons. And this is a diagram that nuclear physicists love. What it's showing in black is all the stable, what do you call a particular mixture of protons and neutrons. Yep. And let's zoom in so we can actually read it a bit. So down here is hydrogen with one proton and no neutrons. And down there, I guess, would be a neutron with one neutron and no and protons. protons. And then helium-3, which has two protons and one neutrons. Uh, helium-4 with two of each, and so on. So the periodic table of elements that we're kind of used to is kind of a, a, a small abbreviated version, right? It's only when the protons and neutrons are equal, but really, all this other stuff exists. And what you can see is there's kind of the black ones here are the ones that are stable. Yep. So these ones will last forever. And they tend to be on a kind of diagonal line here with roughly the same number of neutrons and protons. Yeah, I guess you go from 2 and 2 to 3 and 3 to 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 8. That's right. So well, the different colours indicate ones that are radioactive and unstable. So pretty much most of these are radioactive and unstable. It's only these black ones that are... Fine. Now, the terminology here is if you have things with the same number of protons, and that means the same number of electrons, yep. but different numbers of neutrons, these are called isotopes. And you're going to hear that a lot as this course goes on, because isotopes are incredibly useful. So going a horizontal line here, for example, here are the different isotopes of carbon. They all have six protons six electrons, but they vary in the number of neutrons. So you essentially can have 16 different versions of carbon. Well, you could in principle have six uh, protons and a 10,000 neutrons. That's true, okay. Um, now the unstable ones you don't tend to get on Earth because they are radioactive. Uh -huh. And when they're radioactive, they, they tend to emit something and change into something that's more stable. Ah, so, so there's this natural process that happens to get them. So they want to be stable. Anything that's uh, unstable, and we'll talk about why in a bit, will tend to somehow one of the protons, neutrons will change into a proton or it will fire something out right. or somehow it will convert itself, which is why you don't generally find all these other things. I mean, let's um, zoom in on carbon, for example. Yep. So carbon has two stable isotopes, the black ones. There's carbon-12. 
So that would be six protons, six electrons. Yeah, the little number at the top in front, yeah. say 12, a little 12 at the top and then a C down the bottom, that tells you the total number of neutrons and protons. Yep. It's called the atomic mass. Yep. Um, whereas the atomic number is six, which tells you how many protons there are and how many electrons. Yep. And it's called carbon 12. That means the sum of the protons and neutrons is 12. So we know there are six protons. There must therefore be 12 minus six. Yep. So six neutrons. Yep. Um, and then you have carbon-13, which is also stable. So you'd have to say then 13 minus 6, so there's 7 neutrons. That's right. Um, now, uh, if you look at the carbon in your body, sort of 99% of it's going to be carbon-12, and about 1% of it's going to be carbon-13. Okay. And then you get other isotopes. And as you go further and further away from these black ones, they become more and more unstable. So carbon-14 is uh, one that we know a lot about because it's used in carbon dating. That's right. And it's produced when cosmic rays plough into the upper atmosphere, and sometimes they will add an extra neutron to some carbon. And so you're now having a radioactive version of carbon. That's right. And it has what's called a half-life of 5,700 years. So once you get to that state, it will then take 5,700 5, years, years to get down one. To convert into something else. That's right. Which might be converts back into this. It's probably beta decay, so what it'll do is it'll probably move into uh, one of the neutrons will turn into a proton, it'll turn into probably nitrogen. Right. And so that's used for dating things because um, when a plant is alive, it's bringing in carbon from the atmosphere, some of which has this radioactive carbon 14 that's been produced by cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere. But then once it's solidified into a plant or a bit of wood or something like this, it's not going to be breathing anymore. Yep and it'll slowly decay away. Okay. So when you just die, you'll have a higher percentage of the carbon-14 as you stay dead for longer, and that's how archaeologists keep in, in living. So really, so it's, so it's the, this range of, of isotopes per element that actually not just are obviously useful for life, but you can do other scientific measurements with. And oh, we're going to talk a lot more about that. That's right. And as you go further away, like carbon-15, which as far as I know is of no practical use, and it has a half-life of two and a half seconds. So that's a big difference between carbon-14 and carbon-15. So the half-life of infinity, this will stay around forever. That'll stay around 5,000 years. That'll stay around two and a half seconds. And it gets worse, I assume, going. Yeah, carbon-16, it's 125 milliseconds. Okay. <laughs> So, so by, by a tenth of a second. <laughs> yeah. So these are not only really hard to create, but they're only around for fractions of a second. And as you go further away, it gets down to the billionths or trillionths of a second. So generally speaking, you don't see things like this unless you're a nuclear physicist and you're creating them in your own reactor. Because and even the then, it's, you blink and you've missed it. That's right. You have to observe them really quickly. Um, and in principle, there are probably more things out beyond here. They just last such a short period of time that they're, hard to they're gone before anyone can even see they are there. Yeah. So. What we really care about is the ones either on this black tray line or close to it. Okay.